Hello and welcome to the Pursuit Rooted podcast. I am Joseph Johnson and this is my lovely wife. Samantha. And we are the pastors of Pursuit at Richmond House of Prayer. And we are in the process of doing our Q&R. This is part two. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't listened to part one, I feel like there's was, there was some good questions. Those were good questions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's just jump right into it. Okay. What is your favorite biblical story? Oh, gosh. Um, oh. I like the... <laughs> it's okay Joe. if you want to tell people that Song of Solomon reminds you of me. It's okay. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I don't get mood to edit that. Um, no, I keep thinking of like um, uh, Philip and Samaria and the eunuch and being translated, and that whole story is just. He's out in the desert. And- yeah, it's really cool because, well, it's really cool for a lot of reasons because there's like revival going on, and then he leaves it to go out there, and then there's just random person. But I think there's a lot of concepts I like to that story. One just being obedient. Mm-hmm. Even in the midst of like, you're like, oh yeah, my ministry is blowing up. And God's like, mm, I don't need you to go to the desert. I want you to stop ministering and go to the desert. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really cool that the survival was going on. That's a cool part of the story. But then the fact that he was obedient and he went out there and it was like, God asked him to stop all of this for one. And he was obedient to it. And then he saw this really cool miracle at the end where he was like translocated, which I think is just like, it blows my mind. Yeah. Um, and then the whole thing with the, the eunuch and... You know, his life's forever changed, and he gets baptized, and I, I, I think that's a really cool story. That's a cool story. Yeah. I like that. I think that might be one of my favorites, because there's a lot of different... You could get a lot of different sermons out of that story if you want yeah. to. I, <clears throat> there's a lot of the New Testament stories from the book of Acts and, and the Gospels that I like, but the Old Testament stories are just like I couldn't pick from the Old Testament wild. though. It's like it's a soap opera from start to finish. It's like a soap opera in your mind. You're like, what is going to happen next? Yeah, I joke. I was sitting here jokingly thinking like Balaam and his donkey. Like that whole interaction is just hilarious. Where he doesn't even question the fact that his donkey speaking to him. It, it, he's yeah. just like he's just mad, and it's like, hold up, boss, did you? Do you realize who's talking to you? It's a donkey. It's a donkey. Uh-huh. It's a donkey talking to you right now. Yeah, it reminds me of like uh, the donkey off Shrek. <laughs> well, and I always think about it too. Uh, it was like one of the times that, or was it Paul or Peter that was in prison? I can't remember. And they're praying at the house church and then he gets out. Was it Paul or Peter? It was Peter. Okay. Yeah, and, the, and then they, the he comes to the comes. door and they don't believe the, like, the, the his girl. Angel. It's like, it's his angel. And you're like, wait a minute. Are angels that common? Yeah. That you literally think it's his angel and not him. Yeah. Like all these questions in my head. So that's another cool one. But yeah. <clears throat> I I really love the I love the stories like that. Um the more kind of obscure stories in the in the Old Testament. Um but like the interaction where any of the interactions where God and like God and Abraham are talking, those are really Incredible stories. Or Moses on the mountain with the the thunder and the, and the fire. fire, fire you talked about that so many times, and then I, I read have, it in that yeah. book, and it and it just completely changed the way I th- I saw it, and I thought, like you, I just thinking about that in my head and seeing that from afar off, like ha- how just fear the Lord. So when we had the class at the bakery a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I read through that and I like made everybody stop. And, and just imagine it while I, was I should let you it. borrow my book and read it out of that. That I mean, the way she brought it, broke it down in that was just so. And to, to explain that, because we're having a conversation yeah. here, and you're supposed to answer your question. Know, we're supposed to be so I think I think one of my favorite stories would be whenever the fiery presence of God sits down on top of the mountain on Sinai, mm-hmm. and the way that I mean this, I'm, I'm taking some like leeway here yeah. with this, but when the presence of God sat on the mountain. There was the fire and there was the smoke and there was the the thundering. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen a volcano erupting, the atmosphere around a volcanic eruption can become so energized that lightning just starts 
just crackling off in, in all directions. And the, some of the pictures are absolutely mind blowing. Just the energy. The energy that, yeah, the, it, it's, it's just, it has to discharge. So I'm just imagining when they're at the foot of the mountain and Moses is looking up and he sees the fiery presence of God on the mountain, which is, this is, this is a new Eden is what's happening here. Like this is the first time that God has invited someone into his space since Eden. And if you remember, they put the cherubim at the gate of Eden, at the entryway to Eden, and he would go every direction and he had a fiery sword that they couldn't come through. And then Moses, God tells Moses to come up and Moses goes through the fire to get into the presence of God. It's like a purging. They're this imagining like being at the foot of that mountain and looking and seeing that fire coming down and just blazing the top of that mountain and smoke and thunder and lightning. And you can imagine why the Israelites are at the foot of the mountain and were like, we're scared to death. And yeah, Moses and is it, like, it don't be scared. It gives you a different perspe uh, perspective on like what they were thinking and like mm -hmm. why they chose to be like, Moses, no, you go. Yeah, yeah. But then I also think about, about the, the Amorite herdsman that lived 100 miles away who was, you know, just kind of getting up out of the bed and he was walking outside and he looks and he's like, Honey, was that mountain on fire yesterday? And she's like, no, 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 what are you talking about? And for days they sit here and see this presence resting on the mountain. And then they begin to, to hear word of, of, uh, of what God did in Egypt and the fear of the Lord begins to spread across the country and these people are seeing the power and presence of God displayed at Sinai. Yeah, I wonder how far off you could see it. I would say a very long way. I would think so too. Yeah. But also you have to think about in this situation, like with Moses, like, I don't, I don't know for lack of a better word, it's the bravery of Moses. Yeah. He'd have, he'd have courage to go. To yeah. say, you know what? That looks like it could kill me in an instant, but I'm going to go. But even if it did, if he said come, then I know that whatever's on the other side of that's going to be good. Yeah. And it's worth it, you know. Yeah. So I say that's probably one of my favorite. That's a good one. To like break down and to really think about what that looks like. I mean, yeah, you could stay with that for a while. Yeah. All right, next question. Um, what is the best way to differentiate between grace and mercy and then abusing grace? That's a good question. These are, it's like some of them are hard to answer. So, so what is, what is mercy? Mercy is when I don't get what I deserve. Yes. It's so like I, you're I, getting a pass kind of. Yeah. Like I, I, so I didn't, I didn't take the penalty of death upon me when, um, so Jesus did. He took the sin upon him and I gained mercy in that. But how is that different from grace? Grace is God enabling me to do or be something that I couldn't. So mercy keeps me from receiving the punishment, but grace enables me to walk in the salvation. Yeah, I was trying to think about it. it yeah, I guess we're, we're thinking about it in the same vein, but I was thinking about it like mercy is like a, a pass, like a get out of the jail free card, where grace is like a covering, where it, it, it changes who you are. In a sense, mm -hmm. am I thinking about that yeah, wrong? Some people describe it as like mercy is you didn't get what you deserve, and then grace is you got what you didn't deserve, as in like God gave you a, a merited favor. Yeah. But but people say well grace is just favor, or they confuse grace and mercy, and like mercy is the judge saying you deserve this, but I'm letting you go. But grace is me getting receiving something. Mm -hmm like an enablement and an empowerment, yes. favor. Um, so I receive salvation. It comes, you know, by grace through faith. So um, I would say that, yeah, I, I would break those two apart because for some reason they've got people just, people just don't know what they mean. Yeah. And they put them together. And I'm not, I don't think that's what this person was trying to do here. I think they were asking what's the difference between these two. So mercy, I, I don't get the punishment I deserve. Grace, I receive the enablement and the empowerment to be or do something that I couldn't be or do a second before. Oh yeah, it's like you're dealing with a certain sin and it's like you ask God to come in with His grace and help you with that and it's like His grace covers that sin so that you can move forward as a different person. Would I, you say that? I would say His His grace empowers me to be free from that sin. Okay. Like when I find, so if I find that like 
I'm impatient. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been actively seeking him. God, help me to not be impatient. And I find in that moment, whenever that opportunity is there, and I sense it to be impatient, but also I sense something else. I sense like a doorway to a different direction. That's, that's that grace. I, oh, actually, I'm going to take a step back here and calm down for a second and then deal with this. Like God's given me the enablement. And as we become sensitive to that and we realize what it is, we find it more and more active in our lives. Um, yeah, I would say I, it, it's, it's enablement. So if I could give to the Spirit is a grace. Yeah. I can't heal people. But His grace in my life allows people to be healed through my life, through His Spirit going through my life. Yeah, is it certain certain um, translations are like they're called little gracelets? Yeah. So, so the the uh, the way we would just the way you would describe the gifts of the Spirit is they're little yeah they're gracelets, which is like little gifts of grace to enable you to do what you couldn't do. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's how I see this. So then, what does it mean to abuse grace? I, this is this is so good. I'm glad that they added this question to it. Is that and I think the context that this is being asked in is where we see people with the hyper grace mentality. Mm. And the hyper grace mentality says, I, it doesn't matter if I sin or not, God's got me. Mm. Based off the conversation we just had, that's a, that, those people are completely misunderstanding what grace is. To say, it's okay if I sin because God's got me. That's not what grace is. Grace enables me to walk away from something. So if I'm abusing grace, the only way you can... You... But I, I, in my head now, I, now, I'm thinking like there's whole denominations that abuse abuse that concept. Well, I don't know about whole denominations. I think there's, I think there's, there's communities that can, there's individuals that can, but I don't know if I'd say whole denominations. Do you think whole denominations abuse grace? Well, I'm just thinking... Well, hold on a second. Let's define what abusing grace is. Okay. Like what do you think, what would it be to abuse grace? Like God wants me to use grace to live, but the result of the result of me using grace should be that I look, act, sound, think more like Jesus. Uh -huh. So for someone to say, it's okay, I can do this. God's got me because his grace covers it. That they don't even know what grace is. Yeah, the, the, and well, I'm just thinking about like friends that I've had in the past, like that that's grown up in certain churches and it's like, well, I got saved when I was eight. And so no matter what, I, I can go out and live a life of hell pretty much, but I'm fine because I got saved when I was eight. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah I, mean, kind, I would define that as an abuse of grace. Would you not? Well, I would say that's not even grace. That's, they, that, they don't even know what grace is. That's not even grace. Grace isn't even in that, that conversation. They're calling it grace, but they don't even know what grace means. Okay. So what are they abusing? They're not, they're not abusing anything other than, than the fact that Jesus and his graciousness saved them. Like, you can't abuse grace. Like you, you can't, if you use grace, it's going to enable you to move forward, to look more like Jesus. So you're saying the, the hyper grace movement is actually uh, not, not real. It has nothing to do with grace at all. Okay. It's just yeah. misinterpreted, I guess. Yeah. All they're doing is just sinning. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it's, that's, that's it's a, not hyper grace. It's hyper sinning. It's hyper sin. Okay. Yes. Wait, yes. Coining that, putting it on a shirt. Okay. It ain't hyper grace. It's hyper sin. Now, like hi hyper grace looks like my life is absolutely on fire with the presence of God and I am I am rapidly moving in the direction of being made into the image of God. That's what hyper grace is. So I think we've just done a terrible job as the body of Christ of defining what grace is. Well, some people have. And that grace is actually not being abused, it's just being misdefined. I, yeah, I, like when people, when people say, I'm like, that's not, you, grace has nothing to do with that. And Dallas Willard's quote, uh, about grace is the best one I've heard to, to kind of illustrate what we're talking about here is that he says, true saints burn grace like a 747 burns fuel on takeoff. Now, if you don't know, when a 747 is, is burning fuel on takeoff, they're burning an enormous amount of fuel to get off the ground. It's like, it's like 5,800 pounds of fuel, I think, that they burn to get off the ground. Okay, okay what he's saying is that it... In my life, as I'm moving through life, like a 747 is moving down the runway, I should be living and consuming grace to continue moving forward and being formed and made in the image of God and doing the work that He's called me to. That's what it looks like to use grace. And as I'm going, I find that there's a hiccup in my life that needs to be dealt with. I surrender and I receive grace and I keep moving forward. So these people who are just like, 
living in a loop of sin and saying, I can do what I want and there's not consequences. For one, they don't have a mindset of eternity. They don't have a mindset of that he's king. And two, they don't even know what grace is. Like, I think if we want to say abuse grace, like if we wanted to define abusing grace as using a lot of grace, then I would say that God wants us to abuse grace. He wants us to burn it all. He wants us to use grace to live because that's what's going to make us into the image of Christ. That's what we need to live. If I use my own strength to live, then I will get to the extent of my strength. Because if you're, you're saying if you're using grace, then you're not going to be in the sin cycle. That No, I'm coming out of that. Grace will bring me out of that. So if someone's like, well, I'm saved, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting slammed every you know weekend, uh-huh. then it's like, you're, I, I don't know, what, what are you saved from? Like, what are you saved to? Well, God's got me. Grace covers it. What do you mean grace covers it? Like, there's like we're using words that we don't even know what they mean anymore. So I would say that, uh, yeah, like to, to abuse grace, the context here is that we, we live a life however we want and just say Jesus has us. I think that's the context to this. Mm-hmm. And what I would say is that there's not an ounce of grace involved in that because grace is enablement to be like Jesus. This has been a very enlightening conversation. If you'd like Thank to, you. <laughs> I was going to make you. a joke. Yeah. Um, yeah, which that's why I talked about when I spoke down in Millsboro today. That was, a, no, I talked I a lot about. I haven't listened to it yet. I, ta- so. I talked a lot about grace in that. So, okay, we got f- three minutes here. Do you think we, let's, let's, yeah, let's sl- do one more. Let's slip one more in <laughs> yep. here. Um, dum, 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 dum. I'm trying to find a, maybe a, a lighthearted one here. Um, I don't know. That one, that one was there's, pretty lighthearted. There's some, uh, There's some good ones here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, well, I've got I've got one lined up, but it's going to take us over. So, um, what is your? I say, what is your favorite spiritual gift to see in operation? Oh. I would say faith. Okay. Yes. Because it is a spiritual gift. Okay. Yeah. No, keep going. Go ahead. But those are the times that you see the miracles, like more than anything. Like, yeah. Yeah. I so was, what is it? Like, crea- like creative miracles. What like, does that look like? How do you see faith I, on someone? I know. I don't know. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen it personally, but like the stories of it. I've, I think I've seen a gift of faith. I've seen a gift of faith in operation. I've been around a gift of faith in operation multiple times, but I've seen, I've seen it happen one time that I can clearly remember. Okay. I was in Brazil in 2017, mm-hmm. and it was like 11 something at night, and the buses were all leaving, and I was walking down the aisle, and we were in this Baptist church, and there was, uh, it was there was a few thousand, a couple thousand people there that night, and I bet we saw four or five hundred healings. It was crazy. And the next night we went back and the Holy Spirit baptized, I would say, 40% of that congregation. You were in Brazil in 2019, by the way. It wasn't 2017. But go ahead. Oh, it was 2019. And then we went back this past year. Yep, yeah, sorry, 2019. Um, but as I was leaving, the the one guy was around her, but he was like, go to the bus. Like, everybody has to, we, we've got to go. And I'm leaving and I look and... Randy's praying for this line of people. And he said, um, I was, as I was walking down the aisle, he, he turned and looked at me because his assistant was like trying to get him to go too. And he said, you, come here. And I was like, okay. So I walk over there and he's praying for this line of people. And he said, I don't know what God's doing right now, but he's he, everybody I've prayed for tonight of psoriatic arthritis has been healed and these people are here to get prayer and I have to leave. Do not leave without praying for them. So he leaves and that I saw that that faith on him. And before he left, he was he like went through, prayed for a few of them and they just got blasted by the spirit and got healed. And then there was like two or three people left that I, I prayed with, but I saw, I think I saw two things that night. I saw 
what the office of, like I saw a manifestation of the office of the apostle that night where he was so mission-minded and focused on the kingdom and on the work of the kingdom in that moment and bringing the kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. But then I also saw faith in operation where it wasn't like, maybe God's going to heal these people, maybe he's not. It's like every one of them has been healed and every one of these are going to be healed too. Like there was not a, it wasn't like, a, oh, because this happened, I think this is going to happen. It's like, no, God is doing this right now. And it was a, it was a different kind of intensity. I'd never been around that before. And I was like, what in the world? I don't think it was like, I don't know if that it was like a gift of faith that was being used that, that one night, but like I've never felt so much faith as that night when uh, he prayed for everybody with the metal being dissolved or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we saw all the people around us like that happening too. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we gave her words of knowledge. And that was a night I prayed for the lady that got healed of cancer. But like before they ever released this to give our words of knowledge and go pray for people, I think Mandy or somebody was sent beside of me and I was like, like somebody could come up and ask me to pray for them for a limb to grow out right now. And I was like, I have so much faith I could run through a wall and I know whatever I pray right now, will it will be done. Yeah. And then Randy described that as a, as a gift of faith. Like when you, you, you know, there's I absolutely I've never no felt that much. Yeah. Like it was like, a, it's like a holy confidence in, yeah. in, in just that the atmosphere of like what God was doing, but I had, I've never experienced it that level before in my life. But like, even when, like I said, that wasn't even my word of knowledge that the lady came over with the yeah. cancer and it was just random. And when she was like, when she said it, like before I'd probably been like, okay, let's pray for you or whatever. But I was like, it's done. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? And so. But that, that's, I mean, that's, that is faith. It's, it's, we're adjusting ourselves to what has been revealed and God has revealed that he's the healer. And we have confidence in that. And and sometimes he comes and he deposits an extra confidence in that, I guess, so to speak. And, and faith is a really, it's an interesting thing to like really wrestle with. So, but it's like when you, when you have it, you know, you got it. Yeah. I mean, and there was other times on that trip where yeah. I had like zero faith and like God showed up mm-hmm. and completely delivered, you know, someone when I had like zero faith for it to happen. Yeah. Um, And that's just God's sovereignty and his goodness, but. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. With that being said, we'll uh, we'll wrap up this part two of our question and response. Um, anything else to add before we do that? Nothing? Nope. All right. With that being said, join us at Pursuit first and third Sunday of each month. We'd be excited to have you and uh, go do what Jesus said. Oh,